Life Unrehearsed, brought to you by Leanna's Senior Transition Support, helping you navigate home care and senior residences. And good afternoon. Welcome to Life Unrehearsed. My name is Matt Del Vecchio, specializing in life transitions, downsizing in the senior living industry. Thanks for joining me this Sunday afternoon. We have a jam-packed show today coming up on the first half of Life Unrehearsed. Is it possible that our lives would be significantly enriched if we all had a little more empathy? Well, we're, uh, can empathy actually make a difference? We're going to hear from an empathy expert that's been studying the power of empathy for more than a decade. And on the second half of the show, June is ALS Awareness Month. And we're going to have a couple of inspiring Montrealers on the line with me to tell us their stories about living with the disease. And we'll also have the executive director of the ALS Society of Quebec to tell us about some important fundraisers as well as some encouraging progress to fight the disease. Thank you for joining me. Um, You know, the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging, or the MCSA, does such amazing work. And I wanted to quickly bring in Caitlin Butt from the MCSA. Caitlin, um, uh, uh, welcome to Life Unrehearsed. Hi, thank you so much. Okay, we do have you there. All right. Now, Caitlin, you're hosting an event to highlight World Elder Abuse Awareness Day from June 12th to June 16th. Can you quickly tell us about it? And I also want to hear about this fascinating virtual reality training session for Alzheimer's. Yeah, of course. So as you said, we will be hosting an event from June 12th to June 16th um, to mark World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Um, so we're going to have a full week of speakers virtually uh, at noon. At noon, um, But on Thursday, June 15th, which is actually World Elder Abuse Awareness Day, we will be hosting a special training called the EDI training. Um, the EDI training will be offered by Marie-France Dozois, president and founder of the CDS Boutique at our center, located at 6825 Lasalle uh, Boulevard d'Ardin. Um, by using virtual reality, people who attend this training will be able to embody EDI, who is a person living um, with Alzheimer's disease. So this immersive workshop enables participants to see the world through the eyes of a person living with Alzheimer's disease or dementia. Uh, the training will be offered in French from 8.30 until noon, and then in English from 1 to 4.30 p.m. This training is designed for those who are interacting with people living with Alzheimer's disease or dementia, such as caregivers, medical professionals, social workers, and residence owners, and will be used to develop empathy, safety, and communication skills, as well as home adaptation. To register, um, you can call our center Monday through Friday from 8 to 4 p.m. at 514-766-2010. Um, and we really hope to see anyone, everyone there, either virtually or in person. Such a great initiative. Really uh, proud of the MCSA. And I want to thank you coming on quickly, Caitlin, to, uh, to talk about it. Thank you so much. All right, that's Caitlin Butt from the McGill University Research Center for Studies in Aging. All right, now I'd like to bring in Anita Nowak. Anita is a leading authority on empathy. She's a Montreal native holding a doctoral degree from McGill University where she was named Professor of the Year in 2014 and 2019. She's the author of a recently published book called Purposeful Empathy, Tapping Our Hidden Superpower for Personal, Organizational, and Social Change. Anita, Welcome to Life Unrehearsed. Thank you so much for having me, Matt. Well, Anita, thank you for coming and joining uh, me here in in studio. Uh, You know, we're hearing a lot about uh, empathy these days. And why do you think this word has become so popular? Sure. Well, I think uh, humanity has been interested in empathy since the dawn of time, whether it's the psychological perspective, the moral perspective, the philosophical perspective. But basically, go back to spring of 2020, what was going on, the onset of COVID and everything that that brought. We also lived through the spring of BLM on the heels of George Floyd, and we're seeing incredible political polarization. So I think people are starting to pay attention to how empathy can really be a lever for um, change that's needed in the world uh, to address all the sort of the issues that we're facing. And just so that you know, um, I have today published my 2,489th daily empathy posts. That's six and a half years. It's nearly 2,500 posts. And I have seen such an evolution over those uh, years. And now even in the workplace, people in leadership positions understand the importance of empathy. Yeah, we've seen a real trend in in that as well, which has been good for, uh, I think, both certainly for employees, but also for employers. You know, I think we all have a 
rough idea of the word empathy itself, but from your perspective, how would you define empathy? Yeah, sure. That's a great question because there's a bunch of words that are treated almost as synonyms when they really don't mean the same. And I'm not going to get into the etymology, but I put them on a continuum. So let's look at the left side. Pity, followed by sympathy, followed by compassion, followed by empathy. On the pity side of the continuum, there's power asymmetry embedded in the relationship. When you pity someone, you look down on them. Oh, you poor person. But as you make your way across the continuum and you empathize with someone, that's when you recognize that we share a common humanity. So the the definition I use is that it's the innate trait that unites us in our shared humanity without denying or discounting lived experience. So we have all of these emotions like shame and fear and love that unite us, and that's how we are able to empathize, but we can't ever really know what someone's going through. Yeah, I, I like that definition and, and uh, the way you describe the pity and, and, and versus empathy. And we all have it in us. It's it's uh, Some will use it a little bit more than others. I think we could all probably use a little more empathy in our lives. I'm uh, listening to Life on Rehearse, Matt Del Vecchio here, and I'm talking with empathy expert Anita Nowak. She's the author of Purposeful Empathy, Tapping Our Hidden Superpower for Personal, Organizational, and Social Change. Anita, you use the word purposeful empathy. How come? Yeah, because there's two types of empathy. One is known as affective empathy, which really touches our heart and involves our emotions. So for example, if we see a child at a park having a gleeful laugh with a friend, it puts us in a good mood because we're in emotional resonance. If we see somebody stub their toe, we wince. If we're watching a horror movie and the sound is very scary and we turn the volume off, all of a sudden it's less scary. Those are happening because our mirror neurons are firing. There's another kind of empathy called Called cognitive empathy. It involves sort of the, the, the fancier part of our brain, the, our neocortex, where we actually make important decisions. And you can become empathic on purpose by perspective taking, putting yourself in someone else's shoes. And so I think that that's a very important distinction because we can choose at any time if we want to turn mm. the volume up of empathy. That's purposeful, which, yeah. which makes sense. Uh, you've used uh, um, the term empathy is our hidden superpower. Um, That's a big claim. Now, why such a big claim? Yeah, so here's a story that happened to me as I was doing my PhD research. It's about 13 or 14 years ago. I was at Placeville Marie in the FedEx store, and it was the holiday season, and I was sending a package. And this is long before we all had cell phones at the end of our hands to distract us. And the line was about half hour long. I got up to the counter and I was kind of bored at that point and just wanted to get the package out. And the woman who greeted me was rude. And I don't mean just a little bit rude. I mean, she was like confrontational rude and I was taken aback. But I'd been doing some research about the neuroscience of empathy and that we could always flip the switch and become empathic in a moment's notice. So I just had the impulse because I was actually really in the mood to say, how dare you talk Mm -hmm. to me like that? But instead, I, I, I looked at her and I said are you okay? And there was just this moment where she was trying to discern if I was being passive aggressive or sarcastic, but she figured out that I was being sincere and she burst into tears. And 30 seconds earlier, I hated this woman, but instead we were holding hands across the FedEx counter, both of us crying because she said, I've been working double shifts for two weeks straight. My son's at home with a fever. I think I'm getting sick. It's three in the afternoon. I haven't had a lunch break. I'm just exhausted. And that empathy showed up and it really connected us deeply. You know, I love that story. And like you say, turned it on a switch because how many stories have we heard? You know, you're just, you're being greeted, customer service, everyone's got the magnifying glass on that. And we're super aggressive. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, you turn that around. Uh, That's uh, the hidden superpower. Um, Really like that. We have to head out to traffic very soon, Anita, but... um, Uh, And we are talking to Anita Nowak. She's an empathy expert. And, you know, I know some of our listeners are listening. You know, our world is indeed in in crises. There's lots going on, climate change and wealth inequality and politics and all the polarization, war even. But isn't it a little bit naive to think that empathy can actually make a difference? I want to hear your answer to that. Matt Delvecchio here, and I'm talking to empathy expert Anita Nowak. And just before we went out to traffic, you know, Anita, looking at the big picture, 
and, and what's going on in the world? You know, we've got war, we've got uh, such polarization in politics, social media making everyone nasty. You know, isn't it a bit naive to think that empathy can actually make a difference? Mm-hmm. So sure, we can say yes and no to that. I'm going to lean on the no. It's not that naive after all. Now, that being said, my husband is from Tbilisi, Georgia, and I'm sure that uh, everyone who's paying any attention to what's going on in Ukraine or in Sudan or with the unhoused around the world would say they don't want just empathy. They want action. They want military support. So on, in that regard, maybe it's a bit naive. But if you look over history, any social movement, the salt marches in India, the suffragette movement, civil rights, LGBTQ rights, all required people who were marginalized or suffering in some way for some allies to show up and say, we want to challenge the status quo And underpinning all of that for the uh, expression of more rights for people is empathy. Empathy has underpinned all of the massive social movements. And we need it for climate change. We need it for wealth inequality. Um, So I don't think it's that naive. You know, you've been studying empathy for a long time. This is your specialty. Uh, In all your study, I mean, your doctorate, PhD, uh, in everything you've seen, What is the biggest surprise? Hmm. The neuroscience of empathy, actually, that we can become more empathic with practice. So just like you go to the gym, you do bicep curls and your biceps bulk up. We have what's known as brain plasticity. So the more often we think a thought, the more often we behave in a particular way, the more we can change the neural connections in our brain and become more empathic. And there's research out of Stanford with Jamil Zaki that shows just even having the belief that we can become more empathic actually changes our behavior. Mm. And the another thing that I love to share about the neuroscience of empathy is that we cannot be in a state of stress and anxiety and empathy simultaneously. So look what happened over the last few years around the world as all our levels of stress went up, chronic stress everywhere, our empathy went down. And so we need to be intentional about finding ways to downregulate our levels of stress so that we can actually access our empathy. So I think that's really, really important. And the last thing I'll say about what surprised me is that it's actually really good for us. So if you put our brains in an FMRI, FMRI machine, when we're eating chocolate cake, if we like chocolate cake, it lights up the pleasure and reward centers. When we're high in psychedelics, it lights up the pleasure and reward centers. Well, it turns out when we're in an empathic embrace, when we're feeling emotionally connected to someone, it lights up the pleasure and reward centers in our brain. Very interesting. So next time I'm having a poutine or a nice smoked meat sandwich, (laughs) uh, I might be a little nicer to people is what you're saying, right? Uh, But very interesting what you're saying about the stress and anxiety, that it just can't really coexist with empathy in a way. Uh, Fascinating. Now, you have this term also called empathy superheroes. Tell us about that. Yeah, we all know those people. Um, We're talking about People like psychologists who are there to help others, people who are on the front care, front lines of health care, even teachers to a large extent, humanitarians, anyone in the sandwich generation that's taking care of children and adults, people who are constantly looking to support others and be there for others. And I think what's really important for empathy superheroes is not only that they get the credit that they deserve, but we also give them space for the self-care and the self-empathy that they deserve because they are at a higher risk for burnout and uh, empathy fatigue where actually they start to not take care of themselves because they're burned out. Yeah, very interesting. In my world, dealing a lot with adult children and sandwich generation caregivers, I love hearing what uh, what you're saying. I like that term. I'm going to use that term. They are truly empathy superheroes, and it goes beyond, right, to all the way to nurses and doctors and PABs and healthcare systems and long-term care homes. I want to talk a little bit about uh, practicing self-empathy. Mm-hmm. We sh- all have the ability to do it, don't we? Yes. Two little hacks. Mm-hmm. Be in nature. They're, in Japan, they know they call it forest bathing, which is shirin yuku, just spending time in the natural environment actually has healing properties. Another uh, way to practice self-empathy is at night when you're berating yourself about the things you didn't get done instead of acknowledging all that you did accomplish, to put your hand on your heart and just breathe deeply and say, I did what I could today. Um, because we really put ourselves under a lot of pressure. Oh, I like that. Listening to Life on Rehearse, Matt Del Vecchio here, and I'm talking to empathy expert Anita Nowak. Anita, you just put out a book called Purposeful Empathy, Tapping Our Hidden Superpower for Personal, Organizational, and Social Change. So what do you hope readers will take away from this book? 
I hope that they will turn up the volume of empathy in their lives because we need it. I think we're at an all hands on deck moment in humanity and human history. And I also think it's an invitation to ter- improve the quality of their life. You know, Maslow, we have all remember Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? When our baseline needs get met, we try to achieve what's known as self actualization, achieving our full potential. Well, just before he died, he actually realized how flawed his own. Um, uh, framework was. And he's like, no, actually, what we really want to achieve is self transcendence, that is being of service to something greater than ourselves. And I think um, we all have the opportunity in our life on a day to day basis to look around and see how we can be helpful. We can turn up the volume of empathy in our classrooms, in our workplaces, in our public policies. And so the the book is an invitation to do that. No, I like that. And and I think the timing is actually very good. I'm still fascinated by what you're describing about the stress and anxiety and bigger picture going back and looking back in, in the years of this world pandemic where, yes, maybe our ability to empathize was reduced. And as we get out of this pandemic, I'm wondering big picture as well, if it, it will help us be a little more empathetic. I think we need this, especially in this world of, of, of social media. How can um, uh, we pick up a copy of the book? Love it. If you're in Montreal, you can go to Paragraph on McGill College or the McGill Bookstore on Sherbrooke Street, just outside the Roddick Gates or anywhere online that you like to shop. Well, oh, very good. Now, I have to ask you, you're here in studio with me and, and you've got your husband and your and your beautiful daughter, Annika, here with us. And you've just been on a whirlwind tour to to promote your book because this just isn't a book that you're going to put out in, in, in Montreal. Can you quickly tell us about this crazy tour you've been on? Yeah, so I did 26 speaking events over the last month uh, across seven different cities on the West and East Coast. And I just want to share a final anecdote, if you'll allow I took an Uber drive with, for an hour from um, just above Yonkers into Manhattan for an event. And this gentleman um, was from the Dominican Republic. And when I got into the Uber, I asked to sit in the front seat, if you wouldn't mind, with him so we could chit chat. We had a long conversation for an hour. And when I got out, I'll never forget this. He reached and held my arm just as I was leaving. And he said, in 20 years of driving in Manhattan, I've never had someone sit in the front and ask to sit in the front. Thank you for humanizing (laughs) me as a driver. It was a great Unbelievable. 20 years doing that. Last word to our listeners. Any advice as to how we might be able to be a little more empathetic? Smile more often. (laughs) Say someone's name when you see their name on their name tag. Hold the door open. There's so many ways that we can show kindness and empathy. Uh, Great words of advice. Well, I want to thank you very much, Anita, for coming here on, on Life Unrehearsed. Thank you, Matt. All right. That's Anita Noack, empathy expert and author of Purposeful Empathy, Tapping Our Hidden Superpower for Personal, Organizational, and Social Change. Thanks a lot, Anita. Uh, Next up on Life Unrehearsed, June is ALS Awareness Month. We're going to have the Executive Director of ALS Society of Quebec that's going to join me, as well as two inspiring Montrealers, a wonderful woman in her 20s, and, and another gentleman, both living with ALS. We're going to hear their incredible stories that's going to be coming up 